So uh, back up here in terms of uh, global uh, temperature is uh, mostly what we're talking about, but also uh, some other pieces of evidence that relate to that. So I'm going to talk a lot about ice uh, today as well. So the first uh, kind of empirical way to measure temperature is, of course, in this icon here is with a thermometer. And so that's, um, those are the kind of most iconic graphs of global warming are graphs of uh, temperature measured with thermometers at the Earth's surface. So this would be an example of a, of a modern weather station. So a, there's a thermometer in this little instrument right here, and it's also measuring you know, solar well, it has solar panels for power, but it, it does measure solar radiation and wind and all sorts of other things, rain. Um, but we have networks of weather stations around the world. Uh, and so this is kind of the current um, way that we're measuring uh, global temperature. Here's a map of how the distribution of these have changed over time. So of course, uh, in the 1800s, for example, it was much less common to be measuring uh, temperature and the technology was uh, less sophisticated. Um, but we still had a pretty decent global network of uh, surface stations, surface weather stations back in the 1800s, uh, mostly in the northern hemisphere and of course uh, biased towards uh, land. Um, and then here's what it looked like in 1930. And then here's what it looked like in 1970. So by 1970, you really had a robust global uh, network of weather stations recording uh, the temperature. And so these, you know, as you go back further in time, there's more uncertainty as to what the global average temperature is because you have less weather stations. But then past about the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, basically it's sampled well enough that you have a really, really good idea of what the global average uh, temperature is. And so this is um, our graph of global average temperature. So a number of different uh, organizations make graphs like this. This one's from Berkeley Earth. Uh, and so this is just taking essentially these um, temperature measurements going back in time and doing you know various statistical weighing to make make sure that you're representing different areas of the earth uh, accurately in terms of space and you're not like oversampling different areas and just putting it together to get a global average uh, temperature and so these are typically um, shown as anomalies so an anomaly just means that you are uh, representing the temperature with respect to some average. So in this case, the average is from 1951 to 1980. So that that's why if you look at like 1950, so here's like 1951 right here to 1980, that lines up right on zero because that's just how it's defined. So it's they're subtracting whatever the average was over that time period out. And so anything that's negative just means it was below average relative to 1951 to 1980. And anything that's positive means it was above average relative to 1951 to 1980 relative to that average. So it doesn't mean um, that it's above zero Celsius and below zero Celsius. It just means above average over that entire time frame or below average over that entire time frame. So the main you know, thing that you can see from a graph like this is not what the actual temperature of the Earth was, but just the change in temperature. So you can see it went from about negative um, 0.4 to about 0.8 over this time period from the 1850s to 2020. Uh, so looking at about 1.2 degrees Celsius rise, and you'd multiply that by 1.8 to get uh, Fahrenheit changes. So that is our modern contemporary global warming. That's what people are referring to when they're talking about global warming. It's basically this warming from the 1800s to the present.
Okay, so this is so what you're going to see here is um, multiple things that we just talked about is how the network of temperature of thermometers changes over time. So when we start back here in 1850, we can't see the entire um, globe. So we, we don't see, for example, anything that's gray is basically not sampled. Um, and then we're also seeing what I just talked about in terms of the anomaly that it starts below average, so negative or blue uh, colors. And then at the end, it will all be basically above average. Um, so this is, let's just go forward in time. So you're seeing the years change up here. This uh, black line is the global average. Um, and then you're seeing where it's colder than average and where it's warmer than average. Where average is that 30 year time period from 1951 to 1980. And so you can get, kind of see um, just how temperature is gradually getting warmer over time. But of course you have variability. You have certain time periods where it's quite cold in some location and warm in another location. Um, and that just has to do with how uh, warm and cold air is flowing over the, over the surface of the planet. You'll see in the tropical Pacific, big El Nino and La Nina events, that's when it gets really cold or warm in the tropical Pacific. Um, but overall, you're just seeing this gradual warming because we have this persistent increase in greenhouse gases in the background. And then they slow it down post uh, 2014. And so you can see like here, the whole globe is now covered, where at the beginning it wasn't the, the entire globe. And so there's a lot less uncertainty on recent temperatures compared to the past. But so then, you know, we want to have other confirming pieces of evidence to show that it's warming in addition to these uh, weather stations, so independent lines of evidence. And so we have that in many um, forms. So one form would be in uh, weather balloons. So since uh, the late 1950s, since about 1958, uh, there's been a global network of weather balloons launched um, twice daily. Uh, and so these weather balloons uh, have uh, thermometers on them and they just fly up into the atmosphere and take temperature all the way through the atmosphere. And so if you compare the record um, produced from these weather balloons since 1958, and this uh, happens to just go through 2010, but it looks very similar if you extend it out um, to the most recent decade. You see, this is in black, is basically the uh, thermometers at the surface, and in red is these weather balloons. You see that it basically has the same trend and kind of the same ups and downs. So that's an independent line of evidence that kind of confirms the trend that we see uh, at the surface. So that's another direct measurement of temperature of the atmosphere. Uh, another way that we've been able to measure temperature is with satellites. So we've had uh, Earth observing satellites since 1979. And so these also can be compared to the surface weather stations, the weather stations sitting on the surface of the Earth. And we get a very similar result with those. Uh, so the satellites are looking down, measuring temperature, and they get the same kind of ups and downs as what you measure from the, ther the surface thermometers. And they get the same uh, long-term trend over the time period when they've uh, overlapped. And the satellites, just to bring it back to a concept we've already talked about, the satellites are measuring the temperature using these laws of radiation that we've, that we've talked about. So they're using, especially Stefan Boltzmann's law, to look down at the Earth, try to observe how much radiation is coming back to their sensors, and then surmise a temperature of the Earth uh, based on that radiation coming back because it knows what Stefan Boltzmann's law is. And so it can convert radiation to uh, temperature of the Earth or of the atmosphere that it's uh, sampling. So today's going to be kind of a catalog of a bunch of different pieces of evidence independently showing that the Earth 
is warming. So, so far we have weather stations at the surface, we have weather balloons, we have satellites, all kind of instrumentation measuring uh, temperature. Um, another uh, instrument that we use to measure the earth getting warmer are these um, floats they're called. So Argo, the Argo array is just the name of um, all of these instruments in the ocean that are called floats that are just basically little thermometers that drift around in the ocean. They kind of drift to deeper parts of the ocean then they come back up and then they uh, beam their data to s satellites and then the satellite sends it to some database and then it's all uh, compiled. And so here's like a map of where these things were um, over 3000. This happens to be just one date in particular. So October 13th, 2011, but they're, um, they've been all over the ocean since 2004. And so these are now another independent line measuring, uh, line of evidence measuring temperature. And so this is what these give you uh, in terms of, this is instead of temperature, it's global ocean heat content, but basically, you know, very similar uh, idea. Uh, of course, we, we discussed how temperature is directly related to uh, heat. And it's essentially the same thing if heat capacity is constant, which we can assume here. So this is basically just showing increase in average temperature of the ocean this red line is over this uh, time period when we've had these uh, these Argo uh, instruments in the ocean. And so this is showing warming as well. And then uh, they can kind of use other pieces of evidence to try to reconstruct uh, temperature of the ocean going back further, um, essentially doing some calculations on sea level rise and uh, sea surface temperature measured by ships. But over the time period when we've had these instruments in the ocean, we also see a rise in ocean temperatures. So that's um, that's another piece. So those are kind of our main um, instrumental measurements of global average temperature in increasing uh, since the 1800s, or at least it goes back to the 1800s with our surface weather stations. Uh, and then we just have confirmation, confirmational evidence from weather balloons, satellites, and uh, these instruments that are measuring temperature in the ocean. So there's also more indirect evidence of the Earth getting warmer. And so the kind of the main um, lines of indirect evidence of the Earth getting warmer have to do with the Earth's cryosphere or just the Earth's frozen water. And so we tend to break up the cryosphere into these different components. So we have um, glaciers. So these are, this is frozen water or ice on mountains. So often called alpine glaciers to refer to ice in the mountains. Uh, we have snow, right? So frozen water as snow on the surface of the earth. We have frozen ground or permafrost, so uh, soil that's frozen most of the time. Uh, we have sea ice, that's ice that is sitting on top of the ocean. Uh, and we have ice sheets. These are often called glaciers as well, um, but ice sheets uh, are the uh, Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet uh, tend to be these um, things that are categorized specifically as ice sheets. And these are huge, huge uh, pieces of ice that are so huge that they bend down the crust of the earth, that they weigh so much and they're you know miles uh, thick. So let's first look at those, how those might be changing, the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. So these are some images of those from uh, Google Earth. Okay, so when we think about ice sheets, this is this is why, so I'm gonna explain here why it actually ends up being an increase in a lot of cases uh, when you start warming, but you're still below freezing. Um, this is basically how, this is a diagram of how ice sheets and glaciers uh, work. So they tend to um, 
they tend to start from kind of higher elevations where it's colder and then they flow uh, down to warmer elevations. So it's colder upper in, upper in, the, in the upper atmosphere and warmer in the lower atmosphere. So an ice sheet or a glacier is, you don't just think of it as just a, like an ice cube. Um, it's a, it has this balance where it basically is accumulating snow, which turns into ice up here. So it snows up here, the snow gets compacted, uh, it turns into ice over a period of time. That flows down downhill because of gravity and it flows into a warmer region where it starts melting. And a lot of times it hits the ocean, which is by definition going to be above freezing or at least above freezing corrected for salinity. Um, and so then it will want to melt when it hits the ocean as well. And so if you want to grow your glacier, uh, you want what's coming in in terms of snow to be larger than what's leaving in terms of um, melting or, uh, yeah, in terms of melting. And if you want to shrink your glacier, you want your melting to be larger than what's coming in as snow. And so sometimes, in certain locations anyway, if it gets warmer but stays below freezing, you can end up getting more snow. And so then the ice mass in that location will actually increase. Uh, so I'm going to show you some examples of that. But so just to, just to reiterate the concepts so far, you only get melting if you warm from below freezing to above freezing. And so if you're warming from below freezing to below freezing from like zero Fahrenheit to five Fahrenheit or something, you're not going to get any melting from that, but you could get an increase in snow. And so then you could actually grow your ice uh, from warming. So you're about to see part of a glacier fall into the ocean. And so what you're seeing is this part of the glacier. And I think the point here is that showing, for example, something melting down here is not like by itself evidence of the glacier melting because it's always going to do this no matter what. Like if you have a glacier in steady state that's going to live infinitely forever, it's always melting down here and it's always accumulating uh, snow or ice up here. So just showing it melting where it hits the ocean would not in and of itself be evidence of global warming or the, or the glacier uh, disappearing. So this is a process that's always going on as it hits the ocean. Yeah, this is some type of a tourist thing where everyone, everyone applauds the glacier for calving. Okay, so here is some actual uh, data showing what's going on with our big uh, ice sheets. Um, and so what we tend to see is uh, what we just talked about that where it's really cold on the ice sheets, that's kind of in the middle or at the top of the ice sheets. In those locations, we, we see the ice sheets growing in size. And where it's warm, where they kind of hit the ocean, um, that's where we see them melting. And so that's what, these, that's what these colors are showing. This is Greenland over here, and this is Antarctica over here. And so the warm colors show, uh, show a increase in the height of the ice. So this is with a satellite that's like 
shooting a laser down at the ice sheet and, and timing how long it takes for it to come back. And so it can measure exactly the height of the ice as it passes over it. And so these, um, these warm colors mean growing. So in the middle of Greenland, you have the ice increasing in height, growing. And then more on the outskirts, on the outside, that's where you see the melting. And Antarctica has a similar uh, pattern, very strong melting in some locations uh, near, the, um, near the ocean. And so just, you know, think about why that is. The ice sheet at the, in the middle at the top is very cold. And so warming is not going to melt that ice. And if anything, it might snow more, and it is snowing more as it gets warmer. But on the outskirts, where it's close to the freezing point of water, as it's warming, you're melting that ice more. And so you kind of have this tug of war between um, increases in ice at the top and decreases in ice uh, at the bottom. And so then the question is, what's winning? And we can use um, these satellites called the GRACE gravity satellites to try to figure out what's winning. What these things do is they measure the mass of the entire ice sheet. So there are two satellites that have a laser uh, going between them. And as they fly over parts of the Earth, the gravity of, in this case, the ice sheets, like pulls down one of the satellites slightly. And so they can measure that with the laser that one satellite gets pulled down and goes back up, and then the other satellite gets pulled down and goes back up. And so they're actually measuring the mass below them. So they can measure uh, over time how these ice sheets have changed, the total mass of the ice sheets. And so this is what we see for Greenland. Um, this is a graph of uh, mass loss in gigatons. Uh, a gigaton of ice looks like this relative to the Empire State Building. So we're talking about a huge amount of ice. And we are negative since these uh, have been, since these satellites have been up in 2002. So we are down 3,748 of these gigatons of ice in Greenland uh, between 2002 and 2016. So 281 gigatons this much, 281 per year, uh, we're losing from Greenland on net. I mean, this also just, just shows you how big the earth is, right? That like, this looks so big, we're losing 281 of these per year that are going into the ocean. But, you know, sea level rise is, has been about uh, three inches since the 90s. So it shows how big the ocean is to be able to absorb all of that water. Um, but this is showing pretty definitively that although we're getting more snow at the top of Greenland, um, on net, Greenland is melting. So the, the melting around the outskirts is outpacing any increase in ice uh, at the top. And so losing a ton of ice uh, from Greenland or 3,748 gigatons of ice uh, from Greenland. This is through 2016. I did find this morning an update uh, through 2020. Um, so it's actually, the rate of decrease has not been accelerating um, as much as was feared about uh, seven, eight years ago. So people were looking at this graph in, in about 2012 and surmising that there was like an exponential relationship here and that it might just kind of crash and we'd be like way down here by 2020. So it actually is good news that we've seen this, this rate of decrease kind of um, solidify around a linear trend because uh, that, you know, that totally changes projections of sea level rise and um, yeah, basically sea level rise out to 2100 if this is kind of more of a linear decrease rather than an exponential decrease. Uh, but still tons and tons of, of ice being lost uh, in Greenland. Uh, so we can do the same thing for Antarctica. So same uh, units here. Antarctica is much bigger than Greenland, a much bigger ice sheet, but we've actually seen less um, total ice mass loss in Antarctica because it's there's still more of a closer balance between gain and, 
gain in the middle and loss at the edges. Uh, but we do see loss overall. So we've seen um, about half as much loss overall um, in Antarctica, but loss, uh, ice mass loss overall in, in Antarctica as well. And we see this very big signature here on the West uh, Antarctic ice sheet, which is called the Thwaites uh, Glacier. And uh, I have a little video on this from Vox that I'll show you. This is five minutes. Rise will be one of the greatest challenges we face in the next century. How high seas rise and how soon has a lot to do with what happens here. Antarctica holds the largest chunk of ice on Earth. Its western portion alone contains enough ice to raise sea levels by more than three meters. And it's in big trouble, largely because of this, the Thwaites Glacier. Its face towers as high as a six-story building and extends for 120 kilometers across the coast of West Antarctica, making it about the size of Florida. It's a humongous glacier that reaches right into the heart of West Antarctica. And that's a major problem because in the past couple decades, it's become increasingly clear the Thwaites Glacier is falling apart. are portraits of a vast, rugged, treacherous continent which has challenged man since first he could sail beyond the limits of his horizon, Antarctica. This is the Antarctic ice sheet. It's thickest in the middle, where years and years of snowfall compacts into ice. As the middle builds, it pushes ice out towards the oceans via glaciers. And the part of a glacier that floats on water is its ice shelf. Today, man-made climate change is warming the air and water around Antarctica causing each side of the ice sheet to melt, but at very different speeds. The eastern ice sheet lies mostly on high ground, above sea level, which keeps it relatively safe from warm ocean water. That means it's melting slowly and remains relatively stable. But West Antarctica is different. Most of it lies below sea level. That means as it thins, water can undermine it, possibly kickstarting a more rapid collapse. It's why West Antarctica is considered the most important piece of ice in the world when it comes to climate change. Here's another view of the bedrock underneath Antarctica's ice sheet. The green, yellow, and red parts are land above sea level, like in East Antarctica. But these blue areas in West Antarctica are all below sea level. This area, where the bedrock slopes continuously for more than a mile down and deep into the center of Antarctica, is the Thwaites Glacier. And it could be the most dangerous glacier in the world. Surrounded by three mighty oceans, the seas are as much a part of Antarctica as her highest mountains. Right now, Thwaites is barely hanging on. In the past 30 years, the front of Thwaites' ice shelf has lost a lot of ice, causing it to retreat backwards. With a smaller ice shelf to slow the flow of ice, the flow of the glacier speeds up. But the bigger problem is the glacier's grounding line, the final point where the glacier rests on the bedrock. That grounding line has been shifting backwards as warm ocean water reaches underneath the ice shelf. It's moved 14 kilometers since 1992. So ice that used to be on land becomes ice that is floating on water, raising sea levels. The downhill slope of the bedrock means that as the grounding line moves back, it lifts an even bigger slice of ice behind it off the land and into the water. And that accelerates the flow of the glacier into the sea. The amount of ice flowing from Thwaites has doubled over the past 30 years and already contributes 4% to global sea level rise. And scientists have recently detected a huge cavity, two thirds the size of Manhattan down here. Scientists believe this could mean Thwaites' collapse is inevitable. How soon that happens is hotly debated. The sleeping continent is awakening, slowly at first, but with ever gathering momentum. The complete collapse of Thwaites will take centuries, and it's affected by many different things, from the temperature of the ocean currents to the makeup of the bedrock. But research shows that humans can possibly slow or even stall its collapse by curbing greenhouse gas emissions soon. That's important because some scientists believe collapse could start this century, while others say it's already underway. The collapse of Thwaites would add about half a meter of sea level rise and trigger a much bigger catastrophe. Because Thwaites reaches into the middle of West Antarctica, its collapse could cause the rest of the ice sheet to collapse with it, resulting in more than three meters of sea level rise in the next few centuries. 
that would submerge not only Miami and southern Bangladesh, but also parts of the Netherlands and New York City. So while there's a lot of uncertainty around Thwaites, one thing is clear. Once it starts to collapse, it won't stop. Okay, so yeah, I mean, the, the main, you know, concern that we have with these, uh, with these glaciers melting is sea level rise. And so far, you know, we have seen sea level rise um, uh, around eight inches. Uh, so we'll get to that actually. So it's closer to 10 inches um, since the 1800s. And most of that has been so far because the ocean is getting warmer and it hasn't even really been so much that the ice sheets have been melting and causing the sea level rise. And so that's what we're expecting in the next you know, several centuries is that as the ice sheets really start to melt, really that really starts to kick in, that that is the main contributor to, to sea level rise. Um, and it is, you know, they, they say that in, in the video that it's over centuries that it takes place. So it doesn't happen, you know, overnight. Um, but obviously that is still a huge problem given that essentially all of our population or a huge portion of our population is on uh, coasts. So you either have to have massive engineering projects to deal with that or you have migration uh, to deal with that. Okay, so that's, so the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica are melting, uh, even though they might be gaining mass in the middle. We can also look at these alpine glaciers, the glaciers in mountains. Um, so here's, here's just showing where those, uh, where these glaciers are, they're in mountains, these alpine glaciers. So here's a picture of them. Here's the river of ice. So these are, you know, rivers of ice that they're accumulating snow up in their in their cold areas, which um, are cold throughout the year. And so you're never having really melting up here. And then they flow downhill to where it's warmer and uh, they melt. And so we see these, of course, where it's cold enough and where there are mountains. So we see them on um, every continent, uh, Kilimanjaro in Africa. And that might be the first one to, well, actually it certainly will be the first one to totally disappear and leave uh, Africa without uh, glaciers. Um, so here's, yeah, just on this map, here's our ice sheets, Antarctica and Greenland, and then here's our alpine glaciers, are all, all the blue that's uh, not those two ice sheets. So here's, so if you click on that, you can look at it. But, you know, you can really just get a sense for the river-like quality of these if you zoom out a little bit. This is in the Himalayas. Uh, you kind of just you can see the tributaries, right? That it's this is me, yeah. So you can see the tributaries of um, snow and then just flowing downhill. And then eventually it turns into a river. So you get to a point at a lower elevation where it's now water and then this is just uh, a river. So as it's getting warmer, this kind of warm side down here is gonna be creeping up in elevation. And so then you can get um, you know, shrinkage of the entire glacier or retraction of the entire glacier. So over time, these are some famous uh, photos of a glacier in 1941 and 2004. So over time, just that, just that change in where the kind of melting line is, um, where that 32 degrees Fahrenheit line is on average, it's going up in elevation. And so the entire glacier uh, shrinks. And so those are <clears throat> just some photos of change. Um, but what about the data? So this is what it looks like um, for, uh, this is from uh, NOAA, uh, keeps track of some of the um, most, or yeah, 30 year, let's see. Yeah, 37 worldwide glaciers with at least 30 years of monitoring. Um, what they've been doing. And so this shows yearly ice loss. So everything that's below zero is um, ice loss for these 37 worldwide glaciers. And then looking at cumulative ice loss. 
And so what we're seeing is over time, these alpine glaciers are melting as well. So this is um, just another, another piece of evidence of the earth uh, getting warmer. And as it's getting warmer, uh, these different parts of the cryos cryosphere are uh, shrinking or melting. So snow would be another one, snow on the surface of the earth. Um, again, this is going to be complicated by the fact that some places are warming but staying below freezing and some places are warming but crossing uh, the freezing line. And so we kind of see this by season. This is the total area covered by snow in the northern hemisphere. Um, and we see overall a kind of slight uh, decline over this time period, so less area covered by snow. But like there's not really a trend in the winter because when it's colder, you're not you're not necessarily going to be melting snow more because it's staying below freezing. But in the summer, and this is you know looking very high, very high latitudes where it's very cold, uh, in the summer you still get a you get a decline in uh, snow because you're warming from below freezing to above freezing. So what used to be falling as snow is falling as rain instead. And so you get a decline in uh, snow. So it's another component uh, decreasing. This is just a map of that showing where snow cover is uh, decreasing. Yeah, so, so overall more decrease uh, than increase. So this is another another in the cryosphere showing less ice essentially. Sea ice is actually like the most famous of all of these components of the Earth system, uh, showing decreases as it's getting warmer. And in particular, this northern uh, hemisphere uh, sea ice minimum that occurs usually in September of every year. And so we've seen about um, a 50% decline in the extent of the ice in in the northern, so in the, basically around the North Pole, so in the Arctic Ocean, uh, since satellites have been measuring this in 1979. So um, that is this is another one of those trends that that we kind of thought was going to be exponential, and then 2012, like there was projections of it being much worse than it um, has been after that. Uh, and we don't know kind of when the next maybe um, nonlinear change uh, might be, but it does seem to be kind of following a linear trend, which is again better than if it was an exponential decline. But persistent declines in sea ice in the northern hemisphere in the Arctic Ocean um, over this time period. And when we look in the and this okay, this is a this is a map of what it used to look like. So this is the median edge from 1981 to 2010, represented by this uh, orange thing. So this is saying that usually over this time period, the ice extent would be essentially filling up the entire Arctic Ocean. Uh, this is for today. So I just got this uh, this morning. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. So it's again, it's like half of what the what the average would be uh, over that time period. The southern hemisphere is interesting. There's not been a trend in sea ice extent in around um, Antarctica. Uh, and so there's, we can, you know, get into some of the reasons for that. I mean, one reason is that uh, the minimum so this is this is looking closer to like the minimum sea ice that happens essentially in the fall after the after you've had all summer to melt the sea ice and the minimum for the southern hemisphere always goes down to essentially zero so in the southern hemisphere fall all of the sea ice disappears and there's kind of you're just left with the ice sheet itself and so you the increase in temperature can't really decrease that anymore because it's already at a minimum every single, or it's already at zero every single uh, fall. So that's one of the reasons why um, we don't see long-term trends in this because it's like the, all of the ice occurs uh, at temperatures that are well below freezing anyway. And so you're not getting that melting effect. 
So we've seen essentially just a flat line of um, sea ice in the southern hemisphere, so not a decrease. But if you add up the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere together and you look at global sea ice, you do get a decline. So uh, overall sea ice has declined. So that's another, another piece of evidence that the Earth is getting warmer, is looking at uh, sea ice. Uh, frozen ground is another one. So permafrost, we'll come back and talk about permafrost again uh, at another time, but that's just ground that's frozen, has to be frozen for at least two years to count as permafrost, which is kind of a generous defini definition of permanent. But um, if it's frozen for at least two years straight, it's considered permafrost. And then if it's melting, then you're melting permafrost. So it's ground that's uh, used to be kind of frozen semi-permanently, and then it's uh, not frozen as it's getting warmer. We're seeing the area of frozen ground decrease. So this is just another, another piece of evidence going in the same direction that uh, the Earth is getting warmer. And sea level rise is my last one here. Uh, yeah, so sea level rise, both because the Earth, or because the ocean is getting warmer, and warmer water expands, that causes sea level rise. And because uh, ice on land is melting and flowing to the ocean. So ice in Antarctica, ice on Greenland, ice in these alpine glaciers in the mountains, melting, flowing to the ocean, raising sea level. Uh, sea ice melting does not raise sea level because there's, it's already in the ocean. Right, so if you have if you have a glass of water and you have ice cubes and you leave it out and the ice cubes melt, the glass of water does not overflow. Your your line of water stays at exactly the same place. So sea ice does not cause sea ice melting does not cause sea level rise, but ice that's sitting on land melting and flowing to the ocean causes sea level rise. So we've seen since the 1800s. This is using like tide gauges going back in time, um, and then more recently satellite. Uh, satellite laser data where it's again pointing, bouncing lasers off the surface of the ocean and measuring uh, how long it takes to come back. And so then you can measure the height of the water with that. Uh, that is all showing increases in sea level. So um, another piece of evidence that the earth is getting warmer, sea level is increasing. Here's a map of that, by the way. Um, this is from 1992 to the present, where oranges are showing increases in sea level and blues are showing decreases in sea level. And so it's very interesting that it's not like a bathtub, that it's, um, you're getting different rates of sea level rise in different locations. And that has to do with winds changing and pushing water in different locations. And it also has to do with um, the ocean warming at different rates in different locations. So if you have a period where it's cooling at some location, that's going to cause sea levels to not rise or to fall a little bit because the colder water contracts. Um, but these are things that like are temporary that, you know, if, if wind is blowing water in one location for some period of time, like 10 years, you don't expect that to always be the case over the next 10 years. It might reverse, and so then it might go in some other direction. But definitely over the period of like 10, 20 years, you can have um, much larger rates of sea level rise in some locations than others, and then they might flip and, and reverse. So like where we are, we've been lucky over the past uh, 20, 30 years in not seeing uh, as much sea level rise as we could have if uh, winds and uh, temperature changes in the ocean were different. Where, uh, for example, uh, the Philippines has been unlucky and, and seen um, much larger rates of sea level rise than the global average. So to summarize all of this, this is a graphic um, showing most of what I talked about today as, as well as a bunch of other things. Um, it's basically just all of the evidence that the Earth is getting warmer. So all of our ice measurements are showing the Earth getting warmer. Basically, we're losing ice, we're losing sea ice, we're losing um, ice sheets, we're seeing less snow on the ground. 
um, every different piece of the cryosphere is essentially um, showing less ice. We can measure the increase in temperature directly from instruments on the surface of the planet, uh, from satellites, from weather balloons, from these floats that are in the ocean, all showing increases in temperature. Um, there's other things I didn't talk about, like uh, you know measuring um, changes in species migration habits, you know uh, species moving north as it's getting warmer. Uh, things like you know when do flowers bloom on average, and showing that that's uh, changing consistent consistently with warming. So like happening earlier in the spring uh, each year. Uh, things like tree lines shifting poleward and upward. So it's just overwhelming the evidence pointing to the Earth uh, getting warmer. Um, if you're interested in, in like all of the data, I just threw this slide on here. Uh, this is from uh, the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. They have this state of the climate report that comes out every year and they, they show like everything that I'm talking about and all of the data sets and, and everything. But it's essentially just a uh, um, all of the data associated with these things. Um, so this is why the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2007, so 13 years ago now, um, one of their kind of headline statements was that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. There's just no denying that the Earth has gotten um, significantly measurably warmer since the uh, 1800s. And then this is just written, all that written out um, in words. 